six, five, four, three, two, one. You'll never have the sacred stone. <laughs> oh, this you crazy mother. Hello there, Monster Gardeners. My name's Dr. Watt, and welcome to the brand new season of Test Lab. Now, those of you out there that diligently follow the weak plot lines of our shows will be quick to point out that we never really ended season one. they'd be exactly right. However, that's the beginning of a very long story. Soon after episode 7 aired, we began shooting the next episode, our first big LED test. We'd been working on this for over 12 months, reaching out to as many LED manufacturers as we could to try and create the biggest LED cross-test video ever. However, it soon became clear that there's an awful lot of paranoia out there amongst LED manufacturers when it comes to independent testing. You see, in the HID world, everything is pretty much set into a formula. You have reflectors, you have bulbs, you have ballasts, etc. But in the LED world, it's very far from that. The major challenge facing us testing LEDs is that there are all sorts of different types of fixtures. Bars, boxes, no reflectors, huge reflectors. An absolutely mad world of niche ideas and insane technologies. Testing one LED versus another therefore is very difficult because each has been designed around a specific design philosophy. And so a standard test like ours in our 5x5 tent might, in the eyes of some manufacturers, be seen to be doing their design philosophy a disservice. And so, out of the 20 or so manufacturers we contacted, only two really showed up to play, Illumitex and Spectrum King. Illumitex sent us a new commercial model called the Power Harvest, with the promise to send new versions of their popular NeoSol line when they were released. But sadly, my contact at the company left, so we sent the power harvest back without completing a full test on it. And we're only just now reconnecting with them, which leaves just Spectrum King. Spectrum King sent us four fixtures, with the only instructions being, test ours like a test everyone else's. Other than that, test away. And so we devised a barrage of tests for different types of LED fixture and began the huge task of testing the Spectrum King range. The tests took three days and a lot of patience. But when it was complete, we sent the test data to our contacts at Spectrum King for review. This was something we'd offered to all manufacturers we'd reached out to. And then I buggered off to Hawaii on vacation. Now the wonderful thing about being on holiday in Hawaii is that phones and tech don't work too well. Well at least not where I was staying. So this is where we stay in and it looks like Magnum PI house or wherever it was number. When I did eventually get within a Wi-Fi signal, I customarily checked in to make sure the world hadn't collapsed in my absence. 
and that was when I picked up a string of increasingly desperate messages that were alarmed at the Spectrum King results. But not at the output data, they were alarmed at the electrical readings. The voltage and power readings I'd taken were off by as much as 2% according to their projected efficiency numbers and were throwing off their math. So when I got back from vacation, we checked and double checked the test results and after tracing the test lab main 240 volt line back to the box, we discovered a horror show. A circuit breaker that was badly leaking oil and let's just say that using 240 volts was out for a while. After getting our power supply checked out by an electrician, we discovered that the test lab 240 volt line was shared with the parking lot lighting systems and a short in two of the metal halide fixtures there had stressed the whole circuit, meaning the whole thing needed replacing. To add insult to injury, the next day, when trying to test some 120 volt fixtures, the zipper on our test tent broke. And with no 240 volt power or a way to seal the tent, testing ground to a halt. After much discussion, a plot was hatched. You see, since we launched Test Lab, we always wanted to build a semi-permanent set where the Test Lab is now. So now that we needed a new tent anyway, why not build the set too? And that, dear viewers, is what I've been up to since November last year. After three months of crashing and banging, I'm proud to present the brand new Test Lab. Welcome to the Watt Cave, my new home from home, complete with custom signature furniture from the Dr. Watt furniture design line, made from only the finest available junk. In place of the open space filled with old junk and fixtures is a brand new set made in large part from the same old junk and fixtures and for a range of stuff we picked up at the scrapyard. I even planted some grow bulbs ready for summer. And not to forget of course the pièce de résistance, the 2.0 tent. The tent really took quite a long time to come together as we wanted to solve the broken zipper issue by eliminating the need for one. This meant building a custom test station next to the tent that not only kept out the light but was also collapsible so that we kept within fire code. In addition, we installed a leveled floor and a new 10 by five custom grid and quad bracing on the hook adjustable ceiling, meaning it will take up to 250 pounds. Say hello to mixed fixture testing. 
For the shakedown test of this Season 2 tent, we're sticking to LEDs, but we won't be testing the Spectrum Kings. Well, not yet. We decided on something a little quicker and easier to test. Light affair, if you will. The Spectrum King test is waiting on the installation and test of our dedicated 240 volt circuit, and we'll also be subjecting them to a far more intense barrage of tests, because we want to know as much about them as possible. But to whet your appetite for that test, I'll tell you this, during the test lab rebuild, we happened to show the Spectrum Kings to a few commercial growers, and based on their reactions to seeing them fired up on just 120 volt power alone, Monster Garden started carrying the full line. But back to the test. Oddly enough, we found the perfect LED for our shakedown test while clearing out the old shelves. We found a box full of funny brown tubes. Each was filled with a T5 LED replacement that fit in a standard T5 socket. The tubes were from a fairly new lighting company called Transcend Lighting. It would seem that they were also delivered for the initial LED test last year but had gotten lost in the endless in and out deliveries coming through Monster Gardens. As I'd never tested T5s before, and no one knew how they'd perform, we decided to take a closer look. After reaching out to Transcend to check it was okay to test the bulbs, they not only gave us the green light, they also offered to send us all of their other fixtures for testing. And that will be coming your way very soon. So, this first test will be this T5 replacement from Transcend Lighting versus all the top bulbs sold by the store. They are the Spectralux Red, the Spectralux Blue, the Power Veg from Hortilux, and because we blew all of our budget getting Test Lab and the new set ready, we'll be testing them in the cheapest available fixture the Sunblaster T5 single four foot strip light, which actually comes with a bulb itself. So, hey, what the hell, we'll test that as well. As usual, we'll be recreating typical grow conditions, which means in this case, close proximity lighting, 12 inches to be precise, and we'll only be using a three x five space on our 10 x five grid. Other than that, all of the usual data will be included, the 15 grid spot readings in PPFD and the grid average, plus of course, all the recorded test data and all the recorded conditions data, exactly the same as all the tests from season one. Moving on to the results, let's set some expectations, shall we? This is a T5 test of individual bulbs slash LED tubes, so nobody's going to get too sweaty about the intensity numbers. But as it turns out, that doesn't mean it doesn't yield some interesting data points. Let's start with the Sun Blaster, which only seems fair seeing as we're using their fixture for this test. The numbers look decent, although I must admit I've never tested anything under 600 watts before, and the spectrum is certainly what you'd wish your DEHPS was kicking out. It's a 6400 Kelvin bulb too, which means it kind of looks like daylight on a cloudy day, but still with plenty of blue. Note to self, put together a Wintker episode on colour temperature. I'd say it's a pretty good showing by the home team. So who's next? That would be the Spectralux twins, blue and red. These two bulbs are what are considered bread and butter to all of the local growers that live near Monster Gardens. Right price, right power. Seems like a winning combination. But I've always wondered how much red and how much blue is in each. Well, not that much is the answer. Yes, there are blues in the blue and reds in the red. But for two bulbs that were separated by 3500 Kelvin, there's not a lot in it. However, as far as value for money goes, it's tough to argue against either bulb. <music> the 
moving onto the power veg, and that smooth sailing suddenly hits the rocks. We expected great things from this bulb due to the fact that so many people swear by them. So when I started jotting the numbers down during the test, which as you can see are pretty wimpy, we were stumped as to why they were so low, and so retested the second bulb just to be on the safe side. It yielded almost identical numbers. Now I have to admit, this situation had me very puzzled. That was until I started reviewing some old footage, and I came across a shot of the point of sale stand in the store. On the side of that was a picture of this spectrum. Ah, oh, the penny suddenly dropped. It's the UV. If you compare the spectrum that I took to the one from iHortelux themselves, you'll spot the error immediately. And it's these big readings here. You see, our spectrometer only reaches down to around 380 nanometers or so. But the UV in these bulbs goes way beyond that. And I'm afraid the power veg has a big chunk of claimed intensity that we simply can't see with our spectrometer. However, the popularity of the bulb suggests it does exactly what it says on the tin. Finally, we come to the Transcend Bulb Replacement LED. Nobody really wanted to bet on what the results might be because we've seen a lot of heady claims about LED not make the grade. However, the numbers the Transcend put out stopped that conversation in its tracks. Ouch! The first thing you notice is the spectrum. Done with that? Then take a look at the centerline intensity readings. Wow! That's the lighting equivalent of getting beat up and having your lunch money stolen. Looking at the side by side doesn't really look fair, does it? In comparison to the gas discharge bulbs, the LED does look pretty pricey. That is, until you notice that although it costs six times as much as the cheaper fluorescence, it can last up to five times longer, and it uses much less juice to get better numbers. We'll let you draw your own conclusions on this one, because we think it's a bit of a no-brainer. That is, unless you really want that UV, in which case you'll be sticking to the power edge anyway. That about wraps things up for this first episode of Test Lab's new season. We hope to have brought some enlightenment into your gardening brain. And if you think this was impressive, you wait until the Spectrum Kings come up. But for now, thanks for watching. My name's Dr. Watt, and I'll see you next time on Test Lab. <laughs>